He's a renowned jungle bass music and hip hop producer since mid 90s, I guess. Um, you have it's very 20 long. years in the 20, game. Well, that's quite a while. Um, you you also were part of a of a band called Mega Shira uh, at one point, and that might actually ring a bell for some of you. Others. Yes, maybe oh, those of you that are really old remember that. That was like in '97. But yeah, I mean, it's been going in many different directions since then. We're doing, you know, this was kind of the foundation for me, the kind of uh, sound system music. This is really, you know, where I see my root as, a, as, a, as an artist. It's the kind of Jamaican influence that I found in Jungle. And then now in the last uh, 10 years, there's been really interesting developments. If you look at grime, footwork, you know, now the US also getting in the game with the guys from Chicago and Detroit, so it's a, it's a very interesting point in time we're right now. Everything is coming. Everything is basically coming together and becoming one melting, melted thing, yeah. Um, you always, uh, you also have been living in Japan for quite a while, right? It's like, can you maybe tell us a little bit about that? Because I think it's a very interesting um, job that you did over there. Yeah, so also when I was in the uh, late 90s, one of my albums got licensed to Japan and I was lucky to do a tour over there and straight away I got uh, in touch with the local scene and lucky enough one of them was working for uh, Sony Computer Entertainment and I was um, kind of offered a job on a freelance basis to do sound design for video games and um, it was very different back then, you didn't have a... You know, you, I wasn't working on the computer, but I was actually working directly on the PlayStation on a development kit, and I was programming sequences with a gamepad, so it's not uh, as advanced as we, what we see here, but still it was very interesting for me to kind of get a foot in the, in the game and also to understand what it takes to just program sounds day in, day out, not so much in terms of musical content, but you know, what we're talking about, what, what we heard earlier, that you have kind of like environmental noises that after a while also generate some kind of like a hook for you. So that was kind of, uh, yeah, really good uh, school for me. Uh, so you had the opportunity to go out of your usual studio environment and uh, go somewhere else and actually learn a little more about the craft. Uh, just a little bit uh, an information for you out there on screen. Uh, you are invited to actually post your questions on the chat and we will try to answer all of them here later on in the QA session. Right. Um, you brought actually a track for us that we um, will now deconstruct a little bit because of course, you you um, you take care of sonic hooks, and since you're a bass music producer, I suppose that most of the time your sonic hook is located somewhere in the lower frequency range, right? So um, I think you let's listen to the track first. Um, it's called Black Magic, and it's a co-production with uh, Kabuki and Night Drips. And Night Drips will also play a little DJ set later on here on stage, so feel invited to stay a little longer and have a drink and listen to some nice music from Night Trips and Soul Mind. But for now, we listen to Black Magic by Kabuki Night Trips. Enjoy. for Kabuki. <laughs> so
So we have the honor to watch actually closely and go into the project uh, directly on your computer. That's great. Yeah, so maybe just a few words. Um, what I did was, uh, for, this, um, for the Nature Session today is I deconstructed the track and kind of made it a little bit more tidy so you can also see what's going on. So it's, it's very simple. I have um, like uh, three groups with the drums which I organized so I can also show the different elements. And when we're talking about the hook, again, that's the bass line. That's for me when, I'm, when I was starting to produce Jungle. You know, there's very little melodies, but it's always the bass that's the hook. And um, the particular track that we just heard earlier, it's, you know, harmonically, it's not really complex. It's kind of like a, a minor key affair. So the, the bass line is actually just, it's like the, the root and the fifth, and then goes down to the seventh. So it's nothing really to write home about in terms of you know, the harmonic content. So it, the challenge here was then how can you make that interesting? How can you develop that into something that becomes memorable? And I'm going, just going to show you a couple of um, techniques that I use. And um, yeah, just also maybe um, encourage you to try to, to, make, uh, to use automation, also what we saw earlier, to make the whole thing come alive. Because I think as, as musicians using the computer, we tend to just you know, draw lines and move blocks. And that's not always really what sounds very exciting. It might look good, but at the end of the day, it's important to, to trust the ears. So I'm just going to do a couple of passes, and I'm going to show um, some of the ideas how to maybe make that come alive. So I'm just going to play the, the um, project. I'm going to mute the different groups until we get to the baseline, and I'm just going to play the real vanilla version, and then we try to take it from there. So bear with me. So I'm just going to mute all the beats, so we just uh, end up with the, with the bass line itself. And as you can see, it sounds pretty nasty. I'm just going to put in a hi-hat for you as a guide. And now I'm just going to switch to the, um, to the bass channel, so we can actually also just see what we can do with that. So let me just dial that in. So the bass sound itself is actually a, a reactor patch I programmed. Um, maybe interesting to know also after the session you can download this and you can tweak it yourself and it's, um, it has some of the uh, elements that I really like. It has like a, a Monarch oscillator and a filter but I also have a, a oscillator with a pulse width modulation so to add a little bit um, extra flavors. And um, what I did was I basically mapped out all the relevant parameters to macros. And um, this allows me now to um, basically um, jam while I have the sound running. So first thing I'm going to do is just let you hear how it sounds. So this is just very basic, just a very simple uh, pattern. So first thing I'm going to do is ap apply a little bit of glide to it so that we have some more interesting variations between the notes. It's also not between all notes. I'd like to find out which, where the portamento is interesting to create a little bit variation to the, to the um, pattern. And um, I think what's kind of become a cliche is to just modulate the cutoff. And this is something I, I like to avoid if possible and try to use other, um, other means to make it sound interesting. So specifically what I'm using here is a bit of positive modulation to get the bass to have a little bit of a kind of vibe going. So it's not just a static sine wave, but there's a little bit more going on. So I'm gonna open up the filter, you hear the difference? Something crackling there. All right, and now what I'm actually going to do is, this is a very old uh, recording technique. It's back from the Motown days. So it's basically, I'm using um, a parallel distortion. So I have two buses, two groups, group E and F, and I have different types of distortion put on there. So what, I, what that allows me is to add timbre to the bass line. That's not there. It's not just opening the filter or playing with the timbre, but I actually, with the distortion, I create kind of different sound layers. So let me just show you. I have uh, like a, a high pass. Uh, 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 distortion going uh, 
uh, followed by a high-pass filter, so there's only a certain amount of harmonic content left that's layered then on top of that sub, because it's very important that if I would just put the distortion after the sub, we lose the low end, and that's really so important for me as a DJ to have that in the club, real steady. So now when I dial in the, the high-pass, sending it to the bus with the high-pass distortion, you get this kind of effect. You see, you get like a little bit of a tail of a distortion going as well. And then I got a second bus where I have a, a similar setup, but I have a, a bandpass filter followed by the distortion, so it gives me again a different timbre. Yeah, so we can have different kind of flavors and we can even layer them. So I'm just going to give you the microphone and I'm just going to do one take and what you will see me doing is I will automate, I record different um, different uh, channels of automation and then layer them and through this I will tr try to create a pattern and I might uh, fail and have to erase them again but so bear with me and then in the end when it all came together I'm going to drop in the beat and you will hopefully hear that it made a difference. Yeah, So let's give it a shot. I mean, this is not the best take I could get. I would just go around and jam and just until I get something I like and then maybe even resample this and do another round. But if you were to actually compare uh, what we have now with the baseline, if I now just erase all the automation, you want to give me a hand? Right, so this is the base. I think we, there's still something on there. Ah, so it's D. All right, so this would be the vanilla version, and this is obviously, there's not much dynamic going on, there's not much for the listener to hold on to. Maybe you go back. So the sonic hook in that sense is not only the sound or the tonality of the bass, but it's also the, the groove of the wobble pattern, right? Exactly, so harmonically, again, it's not something uh, incredibly complex, but by kind of adding these layers of automation and sculpting the sound, that's when it becomes memorable. And that's when you will listen, when you hear it in a club, you will not focus just on the harmonic content of the notes being played, but actually the whole thing as, a, as an experience. So I think that's, for me, when I, what I also, when I go out and I, I'm in a club and I hear a, a track, that's what I react strongly, like what kind of, uh, how does it make me feel? And there's just certain elements, when you add that to a sound, it gives the listener a certain feel. And maybe that's something, you know, um, which also attracts me to this kind of music because it allows me to work very um, in detail in terms of sound design and layering and also, you know, bringing out uh, elements of the sound that you don't hear there in the first place. And uh, you've, you've used reactor blocks to do that. Is it because you have all of these parameters around that you could just grab and map and wobble? So um, the reason why I like reactor blocks, I also write um, stuff in, in other platforms. I also code in, in reactor and just you know build my patches. But what I like about blocks is it's very creative. So when you're in the zone, you know when you're actually um, have a beat running and you want to create something and you have this idea for like a specific sound how you want to modulate it and this is, does not exist yet blocks gives you a really good uh, w like a toolbox to quickly put something together without getting out of that creative mind state so in that sp specific case I wanted to have uh, um, the monarch uh, uh, sign oscillator for the really um, solid um, 
foundation, but then I wanted on top to have another layer of a square wave where I can add, dial in a little bit of pulse width modulation to get that kind of uh, groove going in the bass line. So for me, it's, it's, a great, um, it's a great tool. And when I work, when I'm really in the zone and when I get creative, I don't want to kind of stop and you know, go in like a different mind state where I'm more analytical. So I always like this uh, analogy from cooking, you know, like when, you, when you're in the kitchen and then you chop up the vegetables, you know, you don't want to be in a situation where the pan is cooking and then you actually need to start, you know, wondering, okay, what do I put in next? So I like to have everything ready and then when, when I'm in the zone, you know, I'm, I can just kind of, uh, you know, dial in the sounds that I prepared beforehand or just pull up the samples I prefer, prepared beforehand or in this case use the ensemble that I programmed. Awesome. Thank you very, very much for sharing your knowledge um, and showing us this little send distortion trick. I guess it's a, it's a classic one that now got revealed to all of you bass music producers out there. So um, please feel free to, to take this information and make it your own. If you want to find out more about Kabuki, there is actually a very fresh um, mix that went online just lately on Electronic Beats um, that gives a very, very good overview on all of your influences and various bass styles, bass music styles that you're producing. So feel free to check that out. And uh, on top of that, you had a very, very successful boiler room session in Watergate two weeks ago, right? Yeah, it was an amazing party and you can take a look at the video recording, of course, on Boiler Room. So feel free and feel invited and check this out. Give us a uh, a little clap for Kabuki. We are now flowing directly into... Uh, please, please stay seated. We have a little Q&A session going on, and, and, and I already s saw some questions flying in. So, Philip is joining us again for the Q&A. Um, yeah, we've got some questions coming in. Uh, knee Taiko asks, uh, Kabuki, there's probably a few secret techniques that you've developed using machine. Can you spill one or two of them? Okay, so one thing I like to use with machine uh, when I'm using the sequencer, this is something maybe um, as a workaround because I like to use work very loop oriented, so I might have on certain groups, maybe like a percussion loop going for one bar, on the other group I have another groove going for two bars, but I might want to have a 16 bar pattern. So what I actually do is I just create one group with no um, notes in the pattern, but this pattern could be 16 bars. So this way I can have little micro patterns repeat at two bars, one bars, four bars, but I still have like a 16 bar pattern going all together. So this is something I quite like to use on the machine. Peter wants to know, um, how much time do you spend on sound design and how much on the rest? So it, for me, it always depends on the mood because I don't think I can be always in the creative zone. So sometimes I just like to sit down with records and just chop up break beats. Other times I just like to you know, sit down and maybe just tag my, my sample collection or I might just you know, work on presets. So I would say sound design, if you kind of count that into the whole bulk of preparation, I would say it's 80% preparation and 20% execution. Uh, Buddha Juke asks, is, uh, is Kabuki using scenes? I can't tell. Could you, uh, it could be just mutes and solos. So what I just showed you there, it was just really simple. It was just one scene and I had like for every group one pattern going. So this was not a real arrangement. But actually I come from the, from the standalone uh, drum machine world. So I used the SP1200, I used the classic MPC. So I very much like this idea that you have patterns and scenes and then if you switch you basically create the arrangement by switching scenes. And I, I find it very intuitive and also it kind of, uh, it connects with me kind of uh, with that DJ world where you can on the fly create uh, arrangements instead of kind of having that piano roll and you always plan ahead and you listen and then you think, oh, that wasn't right. But to actually be able to do that on the fly, I like that a lot. Um, Ni Teiko has another question. Do you use machine uh, standalone or in a DAW? So I like to start out just with a standalone. So for me, really, to 
kind of uh, reduction is really one of my key uh, ingredients when creating. So I like to really reduce all the possibilities. For instance, with machine, I just use stock plugins. I don't have any uh, other VSTs going because I find like this limitation really helps me also to kind of work harder and create something uh, maybe that is more unique to myself. But once I kind of have something going, then I like to lo load the uh, VST and the DAW, and then I just bust it out to the individual channels. All right, cool. Thanks. That's, uh, I guess, all the questions we have. So we're going to bounce it over to Nadine now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Luki, that was great. Um, coming up next.